Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to warmly welcome everyone to this special event, which is jointly sponsored by Radboud Reflex of Radboud University and the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics here in Nijmegen. My name is Simon Fisher, and I'm one of the directors of the Max Planck Institute, and I have the honor of introducing our distinguished guest speaker for this evening, Dr. Adam Rutherford. In a time when scientific thinking and the virtues of expertise, knowledge, and objective ev evaluation are all coming under threat, we need now, more than ever, talented scientific communicators who can reach out to the public to engage, enthuse, inform, and excite. Adam Rutherford is one of the very best of these valued ambassadors of science, with an impact that goes across diverse media, including writing articles for newspapers and magazines, presenting programs on radio and television, giving lectures for a range of audiences, authoring multiple critically acclaimed popular science books, and acting as scientific advisor for major movies and music projects, among others. We greatly appreciate that Adam has been able to make time in his extremely busy schedule to come and talk to us tonight. Now, Adam is himself a scientist. He obtained a degree in evolutionary biology at UCL, University College London, during which time he carried out a project that involved feeding rotting sweet corn to a curious creature known as the stork-eyed fly. He went on to complete a PhD in eye genetics at the Institute of Child Health, studying the molecular basis of retina development and genetic forms of childhood blindness in humans. And following this, Adam was an editor at the journal Nature for more than a decade, responsible for all their published audio, video, and podcasts. Adam's written extensively for journals and mainstream newspapers such as The Guardian on topics of science, religion, and film, sometimes all three at once. He's a seasoned broadcaster presenting BBC Radio 4's flagship science pro program, Inside Science, and co-hosting with, with mathematician Hannah Fry, The Curious Cases of Rutherford and Fry. Uh, highly recommended listening if you get a chance. He's written and presented many other radio programs on inheritance of intelligence, MMR and autism, human evolution, astronomy and art, science and cinema, scientific fraud, and the list goes on. His BBC t TV documentaries include The Cell, The Gene Code, The Beauty of Anatomy, and Playing God. Now, that's not all. As a self-confessed movie geek, Adam has been scientific advisor for multiple projects. His contributions, contributions to cinema span an extraordinary range, all the way from a cartoon for preschoolers, The Cat in the Hat knows a lot about that, through to the Brad Pitt zombie apocalypse action horror blockbuster World War Z via Biophilia Live, a science-influenced film from Icelandic musician Björk. And most recently, Adam was apparently responsible for teaching Natalie Portman the fundamentals of good molecular biology lab practice for her role as a kick-ass geneticist in the superb science fiction film Annihilation. But how does Adam keep himself busy, I hear you ask? By writing books, of course. Eloquent, witty, accessible perspectives on some of the most fascinating questions of modern science. His first book, Creation, approached the mysteries of biology from opposite ends, with one part fo focusing on the origin of life, while the other part discussed synthetic biology, providing a prequel and a sequel to our evolutionary story. He followed this with a brief history of everyone who ever lived, in which he argued that the DNA of your cells is an epic poem, an incomparable, sprawling, unique, meandering saga that captures the history of you as an individual and also Homo sapiens as a species. His latest work, The Book of Humans, tackles a central paradox of what it means to be human, providing a compendium of that which unequivocally fixes us as animals, but simultaneously reveals how we are extraordinary. And I won't say any more on that, since this is the topic that Adam will cover today, and we should avoid spoilers. Now, before we move on, I'd like to tell you more about the structure for this evening. So first, uh, Adam Rutherford will give his talk, which will last about 45 minutes. Then we're joined by our expert uh, discussant, Maite chon a uh, philosopher and communication expert at Artes. She's chaired lectures and discussions on many topics, from current affairs and culture to religion, science, and film. And after about 20 minutes of chat between our speaker and discussant, there will be ample chance for you all to ask your own questions. So all that remains for me to do is to thank Paul uh, Backer and, co and colleagues at Radboud Reflex for helping to arrange this. And now I pass on to Adam Rutherford to tell us all about how we became unique animals. Thank you. Thank you. 
thank you. That, um, thank you very much. Um, that was an extraordinarily generous and about 70% accurate biography of, of me. Um, just, to, just to sort of balance out that wonderful introduction, I, I need to tell you why I'm standing here today, because the last book I, I wrote, uh, the, one, the one before and one, the one I'm going to talk about today, which is called The Book of Humans, the, last book, the book before that was called A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived. And in fact, in both this book and the last book, I feature quite prominently uh, a lot of the work of Professor Simon Fisher. And we hadn't met, even though our worlds had been very closely uh, aligned academically due to his research and my interest more generally in, in the field that he was uh, working in, linguistics and genetics. And um, out of the blue, about six months after A Brief History was published, I got this, this email from Simon Fisher, and it came into my inbox, and I thought, oh, that's great, because I've been writing about him, we've never met. And in that email, he was extremely praiseworthy, he's an extraordinarily generous and polite man, and he pointed out 19 errors that I'd made about his work. And if you want to know what to, the, the, the right way to address an author whilst simultaneously pointing out the stuff that they've got wrong. Simons was a masterclass in introductions, and 18 months later, I'm standing in front of you, introduced um, by the man himself. Um, so the, the, that book, A Brief History, was about, it was about using uh, DNA, using our genomes as a, as a way to tell um, stories about our own evolution over the last million years or so. And, and it was predicated on the idea that we've begun to understand genetics so much, with so much greater sophistication um, than at any time in the past, but also because we've, uh, we've created the, the ability to extract DNA from people who've been dead for thousands or hundreds of thousands of years in some cases, and allow that, the combination of understanding genetics better and the fact that we've got genomes from dead people to, to revisit our evolutionary and, and history it's, itself. Um, and uh, this, this book is, in a sense, it's a sequel to that. So I, I cover about a million years' worth of human evolution. It's focused on genetics. There's very little genetics in this book, but it's much more about our own cultural development. And as Simon said, it is, the, the sort of central question at stake is, well, what makes us human? Now... Um, I'm not going to talk about the whole book. I'm just going to talk about some of the key ideas in, in the book. It's not a very long book. It's about 60,000 words. Take a day and a half to read it. And they're on sale outside after the talk. Um, so some of the things I cover are things like tool use, um, communication, um, violence. And there's a lot about sex. And the, what, one of the ways I'm looking at humans is, as, as Simon said, you know, comparing us as an animal. Are we special? what is different about us we, as we remain animals. So there is lots of weird animal sex in it. I, I, I didn't really want to spend a, a book talking about weird animal sex. I'm just not that kind of writer. It ju I just happened to have written a book which has a lot of weird animal sex in it. I will touch upon it in this lecture, but it's a very different lecture when I really get into the details of how awful dolphins and otters actually are. So um, th this question, what, it, what is it that makes us human. So this is obviously a question that people have been asking for thousands of years. And indeed, entire careers are made on stating that something, one, one particular thing, is the thing that makes us different from other animals. Entire careers are based on that, that sort of notion that there were triggers, that there were singular events which turned us from one beast into the the creature that we recognize today. Now, in all of my work, in all of the things that Simon very generously described just a minute ago, I have tried to avoid that, what I think is a trap, because I, I, I don't think time, nor evolution, nor biology, the complexities of our own journey, is really defined by those singular sorts of triggers. There isn't one thing which makes us human. And, and in all of my work, I like to talk about and revel in the complexity of, of, of biology and, and our evolutionary story. Um, so I like to avoid those very simple, clear narratives that tell you what the answer to those types of questions are. There is a simple answer to the question of what makes us human, and it is having two human parents uh, and having a human genome. But that's an incredibly uninteresting answer, and it doesn't say anything about what is really interesting about being human, which is uh, the human condition, why we are the way we are. So there's the sort of central paradox of, of being human. We are animals, 
and yet we are special animals. We have exactly the same biology as every organism that's ever existed, the same DNA, the same proteins, the same metabolism. Uh, we're on the same tree of life as every other organism that's ever existed, and yet we can do stuff like this, right? In a way that no other animal can. We've, we've surpassed, if you want a hierarchy, almost every other creature on Earth in, all, in so many capabilities. Um, so that's, a, that's the paradox. This is, that's the central question that I'm exploring, though possibly not answering in, in this book. This is an idea that was described by uh, Charles Darwin in 1871 in his second best book, uh, The Descent of Man, in which in his typically beautiful prose, he says, with our godlike intellect, which has penetrated into the movements of the solar system, man, using 19th century language, man still bears in our bodily frame the indelible stamp of our lowly origin. You know, there's the central conundrum. Now, Darwin is, is I think, the most important um, human who's ever lived. And, and he's a pretty good writer. But it turns out that that exact same sentiment was expressed about 250 years earlier by a better writer than Darwin, and that was Shakespeare. So the soliloquy from Hamlet, what a piece of work is a man, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the paragon of animals. There was a point when I was writing this book that I wanted to call the book The Paragon of Animals, and my editor told me that that was way too pretentious. Um, but he goes on in that soliloquy to say, well, what is this quintessence of dust? And there is the central idea. We are, we are animals, um, and yet we have uh, godlike behaviors in action like, a, like an angel. Um, and, and yet we are just matter like everything else. Now, I, I, it has been mentioned that I am a film nerd and I adore movies and I'd written a sentence in the last book towards the end of it where I was describing this sort of phenomenon in a slightly different way. And I wrote this sentence down and I, when I sent the copy off to my editor, uh, she wrote back saying, oh, I like that film quote you put in the final chapter and I was unaware of it. And I wrote back saying, what film quote? And this was the quote. So everyone is special, which is another way of saying nobody is special. What's that from? There you go, it's Dash from The Incredibles. 10 points to that person up there. So in the first two pages of this book, I quote Darwin, Shakespeare, and Dash, which I'm, I'm personally very proud of. Anyway, so the story here is about human evolution, but, but so much has changed in human evolution in the last 10 years due to the things I was mentioning earlier about ancient DNA that I, I'm just going to give you a quick recap. So this is um, a version of the, this is my version of the Tree of Life uh, for humans, where we start one million years ago to the left, and, and this, this is us today. And down in, in yellow at the bottom are uh, Homo sapiens, modern Homo sapiens, us. That we've divided geographically up into three regions, Asians, Europeans, and Africans. But we also know that there was an earlier out of Africa uh, migration that happened 120, 140,000 years ago, where Homo sapiens versions of, of us also had migrated out of Africa, and they... No, they went extinct and they leave no genetic trace to this day. We also all know about the Neanderthals. They're now divided into Eastern and Western Neanderthals. They were a European species, but the more we look, the more we find them in sort of Central Asia at, at least, so we divide them up like that. And a few years ago, you, you might remember in 2010, I think it was, that um, a finger bone, the distal tip of the, the little finger, um, and a tooth, a molar, were found in a cave in Siberia, um, a cave named after a Christian Eremite who lived there whose name was Dennis. And those two bones, well, but one bone and one tooth, are not enough to categorize a new species of human. But because of our new ability to extract DNA from ancient remains, the entire genome was extracted from this teenage girl, as it was. And it was not the same as Homo sapiens, us, and it was not the same as Neanderthals, for whom we got a genome a couple of years earlier. And so it hasn't been officially designated as a new species, but it effectively is. And we call those people the Denisovans, of which there are less than five um, uh, physical, physical remains, bones and, and teeth. Uh, but we have their entire genome, and indeed we see their entire genome in living people today. Now, that's the simple picture, but of course, as I said, I don't like these nice clean narratives because they're not accurate, they're not an accurate description of human evolution. So what we now know as a result of looking at the genetics, looking at the genomes of all of these humans over the last 100,000 years or so, is that, well, it goes like this. The Western Neanderthals interbred with the people who'd become Eurasians. Uh, we also know that the Western Neanderthals interbred with, on a second occasion with people who were just Europeans. In genetic, genetics, is, which is effectively the study of sex and inheritance, we have lots of euphemisms, so we refer to these as gene flow events. Um, so we also know that the Eastern Neanderthals 
had gene flow events with the archaic modern humans. They're both now extinct. Um, and we know that the Denisovans had gene flow events with the eastern Neanderthals and with the people who had become Asians. Um, is this an over-18 lecture? Um, because I, I was struggling to think of the right metaphor to describe this in the, in the book, and I, I... Well, I stumbled upon a phrase that you might familiar, be familiar with from a beat poet from the 1960s in America. I described this as a one-million-year clusterfuck. Now, you might have noticed that there is a branch at the top there as well, which I haven't mentioned yet. Um, so when we add up all the genomes and compare all the genomes of Homo sapiens with the old Homo sapiens, archaic ones, Homo neanderthalensis, the Denisovans, they don't quite square up. And so we're aware of the presence of genetic material in modern humans that is none of the others, none of the above. And so we've actually got to the stage where we are aware of a gene flow event between a human that we don't know anything, we don't know who they were. We've got no idea who this human was, I mean, this species of human. They may be known to science, but we don't know them, we only know them in this case based on their genetics. And I think that's a bit of science which is so incredible that it's almost magical. There's a phantom species uh, within our, our, our gene pool. So that's, that's, the, that's the sort of updated version of, of where we are with human evolution in terms of genetics and old bones. Now, the interesting thing about this is that you know, when, when we look at Homo sapiens, the, the, the date of the earliest Homo sapiens is now about 300,000 years ago, and it's not in the east of Africa as it has been for a few decades now, but it's actually in Morocco in a site called Jebel Arut. And um, the Jebel Arut's Homo sapiens were dated as being about 300,000 years ago, two years ago. So that was, a big, that was another big shift, and it wasn't done using genetics, it was done using traditional paleoanthropology. The, the, the key thing about this is that if you were to take any Homo sapiens from the last, say, 200,000 years or a quarter of a million years, and you gave them a haircut and you tidied them up and put them in some nice clothes and sat them in this audience, you would not be able to identify them. Right? They physically are basically the same as all of us today. And that's a quarter of a million years. So it's a long time to be physically the same. From the genetics, there haven't been any major genetic transitions during that time either. I mean, there have definitely been regional adaptations and plenty of changes, but nothing so significant that you wouldn't be able to reproduce quite happily um, with a, a, a man or woman that is a quarter of a million years old. So we've been stable physically through time for a quarter of a million years. And yet, something massively significant did change within the last 100,000 years, and more specifically the last 50,000 years, which is we started doing stuff like this. Right? And in the archaeological record, there's very little evidence of the ability to create culture and artworks, sculptures with such sophistication, until 50 to 40,000 years ago. This is the Lion Man of Hohenstein Stadel, which was found in the 1930s in a cave in Germany. And it's a 12-inch figure with seven stripe marks down its arm. It's carved out of a tusk. And it is uh, a man's body with a lion's head. So it's an imagined being. This is an incredibly abstract thought that has resulted in this, uh, in this sculpture. So what this is showing is so many facets of our behavior which are what we recognize today. So we think of this as the, we call this behavioral modernity, but basically the person who created that was fundamentally no different in terms of their cognition and their intellectual abilities than we are today. It shows great skill, great abstract forethought, planning, all those sorts of things, and creativity, things that we associate with, with modern human behavior. A few years after that, we have the first, the earliest of a series of of um, small statuettes, which are collectively referred to as Venuses. They're all female, They're, they often have exaggerated sexual characteristics, and for that reason, anthropologists over the years have speculated that they were fertility charms, fertility amulets, and there's been plenty of fairly pseudoscientific analysis of what the significance of these dolls is. But I, I, the truth is, I don't care. Um, it, they may have been dolls, they may have been toys, they may have been fertility amulets, they may have been pornography. We don't know. The important thing about the existence of these statues is that they again show behavioural modernity. This is the depiction of the female body. Um, it, it, it shows, again, enormous amounts of skill, um, the ability to think abstract thoughts, and, and so on. And this is about 39,000 years ago, and this is in 
uh, also found in southern Germany. And then by about 20, 25,000 years ago, we have cave paintings in places like Lascaux in the south of France. Um, now, this is all very Eurocentric so far, because most of the research about human evolution has been centered around Europe for the last 150 years or so. But that all changed a couple of years ago when um, uh, there was the dating of artworks such as these. So these are hand stencils where um, red ochre has been blown through hollowed out bones and created a stencil. There's about 14 of these in a, a sort of large plate inside a cave in Sulawesi in Indonesia. And that dates to about 39,000 years ago as well. Um, so it's quite clear that behavioural modernity was simultaneously occurring, well, well, at least at two different locations at approximately the same time. Now, this next slide is not in the book because it came out the week that the book was published, which is what, you know, one of the unfortunate things about writing books is that they, they have to exist for longer periods of time than the scientific literature remains accurate. And in November last year, the earliest piece of figurative art had moved from being the Lion Man of Holenstein Stadel to a cave in Borneo where there's the depiction of this, what we think is a banteng, so a local cow. There's the horns up there and there's two legs there. And this dates to a minimum of 40,000 years ago. So again, we have um, in multiple locations all around the world, we have the emergence of behavioral modernity, but that are thousands of miles apart. So something had happened globally uh, it, between... 100,000 years ago and 40,000 years ago, which meant that we were doing things like creating art. Now, I, I said that it started off being Eurocentric, and now we have to think about this as being a global phenomenon. It, I've also entirely uh, been speaking about Homo sapiens, us, and that changed last year as well, because now the earliest figurative art, which was uh, redated uh, in 2018, February 2018, um, it, this is a cave in northern Spain in Cantabria, and this is some art that's been known since the 1960s, but it was redated at the beginning of this year, and it comes out at about 64,000 years ago. The only people in Europe 64,000 years ago are not Homo sapiens, they're Homo neanderthalensis. Right, so the earliest depictions of creative processes that reflect behavioral modernity are not even in our own species. Right? They're in, a, they're in a, a, another species of human than Neanderthals. This is all part of the, the revision of Neanderthals. So the, the idea that the Neanderthals were sort of oafish cave people um, that were unsophisticated, grunting uh, idiots is now something we have to completely put to bed. As far as we can tell, Neanderthals were effectively indistinguishable from us in terms of their, the sophistication of their tool use, their behavior, their arts, their clothing, their tattooing, all of these things we have good evidence for. Um, and they did look slightly different from us. They, they tended to have larger barrel chests and a different skull shape, slightly, um, slightly larger brains on average. But, you know, whatever they looked like, they weren't so different that your ancestors didn't have sex with them. Um, okay, so that's a sort of setup to how we got to where we are. Body's the same for a quarter of a million years, and then something has happened. Now, I said at the beginning I didn't like these sort of triggering, these ideas of triggering events, um, but and when we talk about something happens, some people call it the cognitive revolution. You know, it probably took 20,000 years. So I, I think revolutions need to happen in shorter time periods than 20,000 years, but at least something significant happened all over the world. Now, of the things that uh, we, th we have traditionally or over the years thought of as being uh, human-specific, so it's ju just us, characteristics which are definitionally human, and not shared by other animals, the things that make us unique. Let me talk about tool use first, because um, humans are obligate tool unit users. This was the first stone tool discovered in the 1960s associated with ancient human remains in Olduvai Gorge in East Africa. And it is a, it's, it's, it's an obsidian stone, so a glass volcanic stone that has been chipped to create a, a sharp edge. Now, these were discovered by the Leakey family um, in 67, I believe it was, alongside the bones of this human, Homo habilis, um, which at the time is the earliest member of the genus Homo, which is what we refer to as, as humans. Homo habilis means handyman. Right? So this is a species of human that is presumably on our evolutionary trajectory, which is defined by tool use. Now, that's 
you know, that's, that's two million years ago, so we have been using tools in some capacity for two million years, so since before Homo sapiens actually existed. It turns out in, in the 1990s, um, another species of which there's only one sample called Kenyanthropos platyops was discovered, and it's about 3.2 million years in roughly the same location, but that was also identified with exactly the same technology, the older one, choppers. So in fact, we now have obligate tool use within our hominid line, which is at least three million years ago, and we've been using tools ever since. The older one tool set remains static through time for at least a million and a half years, and gets replaced by a slightly more sophisticated set of tools, which are referred to as the Acheulean uh, tool set, and they tend to be bigger, they tend to, be, to have two faces, sharper, and, and um, more variety in them, and they stay stable through time for about a million years. So for 95% of the history of humans being obligate tool users, there's only two types of technology, massively stable through time, and then only into the last 100,000 or so years, the tools get so much more sophisticated than, than just these, these simple axes. So the question then becomes, and this is something that Darwin speculated on, maybe it's tool use, maybe we are the obligate tool users, and that is what makes us definitionally human. Well, you've all watched nature documentaries, and you know that the answer to that is quite clearly no. Lots of animals use tools. Um, and the ones you know about, like orangutans or um, chimpanzees or gorillas, that's al always very impressive. What's really interesting about tool use in the, in the rest of the non-human animal kingdom is that it spans nine different classes of animals, including mollusks, so octopus, um, uh, sea urchins. My own personal favorite is this. This is the the well, it's called a boxer crab. So there's about 40 different species of boxer crabs, and what they do is they pick up. Um, sea, stinging sea anemones, and they use them to fight other uh, sea anemones. Um, and for that reason, they get called the pom pom crab. And the truth of the matter is, I could actually just do the rest of the lecture on this animal because, th I mean, that's <laughs> that's that's my favourite one. Um, I'm just going to leave that up there. I know you won't listen to me while well, that's on the screen. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's, that's one example uh, of, of the many examples of the 1% of animals that, that use tools. Now, the, 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 one of the key ideas that humans do very naturally and not exclusively, but we do it all the time, and very few animals do it um, systematically in the same way, which is the idea of not biological evolution via genetics, but um, what's known as cultural transmission. So it's, it's how we pass on bits of information, units of information to other humans that are things that we know how to do that other, animal, that other members of our species don't necessarily know how to do. And it's not transmitted in a genetic way. It's what we're doing now. It's what, we're doing, it's what we do every time you know, anyone opens their mouth and speaks to someone else. It's what teachers do. In the book, I argue that many animals learn, but humans are the only species that teaches. Now, that, that is not a sentence that is... That, is not without qualification, but it's a good line. But I want to give you a couple of examples, one specific example of, of uh, a brilliant example of cultural transmission in a non-human species. So in the 1980s, a pod of dolphins that were being studied in uh, Shark Bay in Australia, bottlenose dolphins, it was observed that a proportion of them were swimming down to the bottom, to the seabed, and working a, um, a sponge onto their beaks, onto their, their rostra. And they were using these sponges to protect themselves when they were foraging for food on the, the rocky sea floor. Which, and, they often, and they eat things like crab, probably, probably pom-pom crabs. Um, so this is, a, I mean, this is a really cool phenomenon. This is one animal using a second animal to eat a third animal. Um, so on its own, that is an amazingly cool piece of, uh, of tool use, of technological use by an animal. Here's, a, here's, a, here's a, an actual photo of them. Um, it gets so much more interesting when they continue to study them and look at the genetics of these, of these sponging dolphins, is what they're referred to. The first thing is that it's only females who do it, right? So no males have ever been observed attaching sponges to their nose. We don't know why they do that. There doesn't appear to be any loss of reproductive fitness between the males who don't do it and the, compared to the females who, who do do it. So that's a weird thing in itself. The second thing is when you sample the genetics of the animals that do the sponging behavior, females that do the sponging behavior, they're not particularly closely related to each other. They're not in one kin group. Um, and so the assumption is, quite reasonably, that they're actually teaching this behavior to all the females in the local vicinity, regardless of how related they are to each other. So this, this is a really, really interesting example of 
of um, cultural transmission of a specific tool. Um, and, a, and a further crown to how interesting it is, is when you, tr when, you, when you look at all the individuals doing it and compare the genetic, the relatedness using genetics between those individuals, it tracks back to an individual who started this behaviour, and we know the generational time of dolphins, and we now think that this behaviour was instigated by a single female in about 1850. Um, and we refer to that animal as sponging Eve. Um, now, um, I was going to cut the next two slides out, but I'm going to leave them in because I am quite childish, and biology is quite funny sometimes. And I, I, there's a huge section in the book about brain size and um, how, how our cognitive abilities are measured, of which there have been many attempts over the years. Brain size itself is not a brilliant metric because brains just scale with size of the animals, so blue whales have much bigger brains than, than we do. We do have large brains, but nothing, you know, we're, we're top 10 in terms of size overall. So uh, Darwin suggested that um, brain to body size ratio was a much better metric. That is also not quite, we're not top of that, that list. In fact, it was Darwin who pointed out that shrews and ants have a higher brain to body size ratio than humans. So this, this is all part of the, I'm not going to talk about this, maybe we can talk about it in the question session, but it's all part of the rejection of simple narratives um, in, to explain complex behaviours such as intellectual or cognitive ability. The only reason I'm talking about this now is because when I was looking up the animals with the lowest brain to body size ratio, um, it's this fish which is called a Canthonis omatis, and as a gift to someone who is both quite childish and interested in in, in biology, the colloquial name for this fish is the bony-eared ass fish, which I just think is funny. Okay, so one of the things we don't think about quite right in, in biology sometimes is um, um, how much of our biology is an, it, it has been selected uh, by nature is an adaptation, and how much of it is just stuff that happened, just stuff that happened to, you know, is... is happenstance according to the environments in which we were raised, uh, in which, which, which we evolved. And there's, um, there's, there's a phrase that some of you might be familiar with, because lots of writers have talked about it over the years, which is the idea of evolution as a tinkerer, right? There's, there's a different version which I came across, which is not talking about evolution at all, but it comes from Teddy Roosevelt, which I think is a really, really useful way of thinking about how evolution works. Uh, do what you can with what you have where you are. Right? And this is a really important idea because no matter how much we talk about the sophistication of dolphins or pom-pom crabs or whatever, um, there are fundamental limitations to the evolutionary trajectory of those animals because each evolutionary trajectory is unique for each species. Right? So you know, um, a, a totally obvious example is that, well, dolphins uh, are always going to be limited in their tool use because their front limbs are paddles, which are adapted for swimming very fast, and they're very good at swimming. Now, we know everyone who teaches evolution uses dolphin fins as a good example of evolution because they have almost identical bones in their fins as we do in our hands, but dolphins can't do that because they do this, right? So they're never going to be able to, you know, play the violin um, uh, or, or do things which require complex, just um, uh, dexterous use, you know, di digital use. Um, and in a similar way, and this is a very clumsy link to the next section, dolphins are never, ever going to be able to uh, create or control fire. <laughs> because they live in the sea, right? Um, so, so that puts a fundamental limit on the types of technological developments that those particular animals... I'm not having a go at dolphins, but um, the, the, the trajectory that they can be on, which will be different from us. So let's talk about fire for a bit. So that was another thing that Darwin suggested was one of the most significant aspects of human behaviour, which was probably unique to us, which was our, our ability to control fire. It's difficult to gauge when fire use becomes a staple of human um, evolution, when we become obligate fire users or pyrophiles. But again, this has been suggested as the single thing that made us what we are. Um, there are lots of reasons for this. Now, in, in fact, it turns out that dozens of animals are pyrophiles as well, including um, chimps on the savannah in, in Senegal who have an incredibly sophisticated understanding of fire such that they can stand very near the annual um, uh, uh, fires, wait for them to go out and, and then forage for, for, for cooked food with, within the, 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 the land that had just been burning. Um, 
But again, I talked about the Neanderthals and about re- revising our thoughts about Neanderthals. When I was talking about tool use, those stone tools, well, they're the ones that get preserved. Of course, that isn't the entire tool set because our, our ancestors were using those stone tools to craft other tools made of biodegradable material which doesn't preserve very well. There are very few example of, examples of wooden tools that have, that have lasted more than you know, a few tens of thousands of years at tops. Here's one, which is about 180,000 years ago, found in a site in um, Tuscany in Italy. And due to the conditions of the soil, it, it, it has been preserved. The wood is boxwood, which is very hard. Um, and so this is an example of a Neanderthal a uh, wooden tool that's been crafted partially by stone tools that we're aware of, but also it shows very, very clear evidence of having been deliberately burnt on the outside in order to possibly take away the, the small branches on the club itself. So the, we now know that it's not just limited to us, Homo sapiens, control of fire. We know that Neanderthals and chimpanzees and a bunch of other organisms also have a sophisticated understanding and reliance in an evolutionary sense on fire. However... We are the only organism that can start new fires. Right? Wrong. Um, Right until this time last year, when a paper was published out of Australia, the first time it's been described in the scientific literature, um, but in fact had been known about by Aboriginal Australians for possibly thousands of years, we're not quite sure. But the observation that three different types of um, birds of prey, raptors, in Australia, where they, they have repeated um, uh, uh, fires, uh, were seen hanging around near the edge of forest fires and then picking up twigs that were burning or sometimes dropping dry sticks into the fire and then picking them up when they were burning, flying away over natural or man-made fire barriers and then dropping them into dry bits of, of forest, starting a new fire, and then they sit up in the trees and they wait while all of the tiny animals run away from their fiery death and into the hungry claws of all of these birds that are hanging around waiting to feed off them. So maybe this is unusual. I mean, this is the only other animal we think that can start fires. They can't start fires from scratch like we can with a a lighter. Um, But again, it's another example of a characteristic that was once thought of as being unique to humans, which we now know is... Um, uh, widely used amongst many animals, other species of humans, and indeed birds now as well. I think that the thing is that the more we look, the more we're going to find examples like this, which erode us from our, um, our, our pillar of, of uniqueness. How long have I got left? Uh, 10, 15 minutes. Okay, great. Okay, I'm, I'm putting up a picture of the cover of the book because the next bit I'm going to talk about is, is sex, and you don't need to see those pictures. Um, <laughs> So, um, right, here's the thing. So, I was, whilst whilst thinking about the ideas of of human uniqueness, um, I came up with the, well, I didn't come up with, I I copied the idea of Richard Dawkins in the first pages of The Selfish Gene, where he imagines an alien scientist coming to Earth to look at us, to study us as a species. Now, I, I did a different version of this, for my purposes, which was that if, if an alien anthropologist came to, came to the Earth and watched us for not even a very long period of time, they would notice very soon that humans devote an enormous amount of uh, time and effort and resources into touching each other's genitals. Now, if you were that alien species, the, the next question as a scientist would be, well, why do they do that? Now, everyone knows why we do that, right? Sex is for reproduction. We have sex, as all sexual species do, in order to make small versions of ourselves. And it's been like that for probably 1.2 billion years. It, that alien species would observe us trying to have sex or, you know, pretty much all the time in many different ways. So I decided to look at the stats of sexual beha- behaviour in humans. And I worked with a statistician called David Spiegelhalter at Cambridge. And... We worked out that, right, so, so this is euphemism time again, but you're super liberated Dutch people. Um, it's much more difficult doing this talk in front of English people. Um, so of all the sexual acts that could result in a pregnancy, yes, 0.1% actually does. That's, this, these, these are UK stats. Um, so that's one in every thousand acts of 
heterosexual penetrative intercourse results in a pregnancy, and that includes spontaneous abortions and terminations. 0.1% is what statisticians refer to as not significant. Right? So if, if you were that alien species observing all of this sexual activity, and you were trying to work out why they, why they were doing that, why we're doing that, you would never come to the conclusion that we have heterosexual sex in order to make babies, because statistically it just doesn't even chart. Now, if you add on top of that all the sexual behavior that cannot result in a baby, um, <laughs> then the primary purpose of sex is massively dwarfed uh, by the volume of sex that, that we have. Right? So the question then becomes, have humans decoupled sex from its primary pur pur purpose, which is reproduction? Are we, is, that, is that the thing that is definitionally human? We have sex almost always for reasons that are not to do with reproduction. So you ask the question, do any other animals have non-reproductive sex? And the answer is, yes, all the time. Um, and we've been quite reluctant as naturalists over the last few centuries to actually admit that our observations about all these sexual behaviours and tons of animals are uh, basically not doing it in order to make new ones. Uh, and, and many of these sexual behaviours in animals look familiar to us. Some of them, therefore, do share an evolutionary origin with us. Many of these behaviours look similar but are nothing to do with the same behaviours in us. There's, there's quite a lot of euphemism in this section of the talk. Um, and some of the, the behaviours we understand very well because they fit very easily into our own understanding of evolution. Others are totally mysterious. Let me just go through a couple of examples. Do you, I presume you get David Attenborough documentaries out here. Did you see Blue Planet uh, last year? There was this amazing sequence of marine iguanas in the Galapagos being pursued by snakes. And, and I, just, just this little clip doesn't show that, that that little iguana actually gets away from, from the, uh, the grip of the snake. It's an amazingly dramatic, brilliant piece of nature documentary, as you would expect from BBC and David Attenborough. What they don't show in that amazing documentary is a very interesting aspect of marine iguana sexual behaviour, which goes like this. Right, so here's some basic facts about marine iguana sex lives. The females are only fertile for one day per year. The males take exactly three minutes to ejaculate. The males are stratified by size, basically. So you have alpha males and, and um, smaller males. And if a smaller male, a beta male, mounts the female during this very, very precious one day of the year when she's fertile, then a bigger male will come along and simply rip him off um, before he's had his full three minutes. Okay? So that's just pretty standard in evolutionary uh, sexual selection. Um, but the iguanas have evolved a strategy to cope with this, which is that the beta males masturbate before they mount the females, and they take the sperm in a little sort of bundle, a spermatophore it's called, and they've got a pouch under their arms, which they tuck it into, so then they mount the females, they don't need three minutes anymore, they can just jump on the back. <laughs> I, I, um, the, the, uh, sorry about the an action there. Um, so there's an example of, uh, of one of the literally uh, hundreds of thousands of species that engage in acts of solo sexual behaviour for reasons that we, we clearly understand because it fits very nicely into an evolutionary paradigm that we, that we understand. Um, Cape ground squirrels is another example. They're incredibly promiscuous Cape ground squirrels. Um, they have you know, dozens of sexual partners all, all of the time. Uh, every day. Males tend to masturbate after they've had, uh, they've had sex with a female, <laughs> which is a nice trick if you can do it. Um, but we, we think they're doing it because there's such a high prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases, particularly chlamydia, um, that they're, they're, they're trying to effectively flush out any potential infection because they've had sex with so many different individuals in a small period of time. Oh, to be a Cape ground squirrel. Um, so there's tons of examples of sexual behaviours that we sort of recognise um, and they exist for known reasons. Um, here's, a, uh, here's a giraffe, obviously. Um, and giraffes are of great interest to evolutionary biology for a number of reasons. The primary reason being that they are the tallest animal and for a long time we've wondered why giraffes have such long necks and this, has been, this is a sort of staple of teaching biology. For a long time it was thought that, as in this picture, giraffes are actually stretching to the tallest leaves. Originally it was thought that the act of stretching makes their necks longer. Now we know via Darwinian natural selection that uh, longer necks, if this were true, longer necks would be selected over generational time and that's how they got their long necks. 
Um, but in actual fact, simple observation tells us that that is not correct because giraffes don't forage in the tallest leaves. They forage at neck height. So we don't think that giraffes have long necks because of foraging for the juiciest acacia leaves at the top of trees. We think that it's actually probably more likely to be a sexual characteristic, a little bit like the peacock's tail, you know, some, a very exaggerated um, characteristic uh, in order to attract females, or ra rather, in order to compete with other males that females can then choose. Now, here's an interesting thing about giraffe behaviour. They are sexually segregated almost all of the time. So gestation in a female giraffe takes about 21 months. Um, they have male herds, they have female herds. The males and the females only really hook up for, the, for a couple of days every year or so where one male will try and follow a female around for about four days until she either rejects him outright or she gives in. They, they've got this amazingly nonchalant tactic for not being mounted, the females, which is they, they walk forward. Right, so if a, male, if a male is trying, I'm going to do the action now. If a male is going to mount, then the female just simply moves forward. And the, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, it's, it's quite impressive how casual it is. Uh, anyway, so that, so that doesn't happen very often. But um, the males are in herds almost all of the time in in one group. Now, again, you might have seen this on David Attenborough documentaries. What they do with their necks is a behaviour which is known as necking, um, which is when males fight with each other like this. And it's a, you know, what an incredible thing that, that they do to see this in, in nature. And they, they do it a lot. Now, what they do not show in David Attenborough documentaries is that in about 60% of these types of interactions between males, the males are wrestling or necking with uh, unsheathed erect penises. Right? And they, you don't see that in David Attenborough because it's on Sunday night at 8 o'clock and we're British. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's, that's one thing you don't see. And the second thing is that in almost all cases where they are doing this behaviour with unsheathed erect penises, the, the winner will mount the loser and um, uh, pen penetrates him. Right? Now, when we look at the stats of this, um, so there's only been about three studies that observed this over the last 20 years or so, but there's, there's about 3,000 hours worth of observation at three locations in, in Africa, in um, three different parks, game parks. And the numbers come out like this. 94% of giraffe sexual encounters are male-to-male -male and penetrative. 94%. Right? Now, during, during that same three-year period, about 19 calves were born, which is a perfectly healthy set of calves. So it's, they're not exclusively homosexual, but about 94% of the time they are. We don't know why they do this. Right? We, we just don't know why they do this. There was a suggestion this is, this is a hierarchical thing. We're very bad in evolutionary biology at um, uh, accepting the possibility that animals are enjoying themselves. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The one is that we're, we try not to anthropomorphize. We try not to put our own feelings onto animals, no matter how familiar they look to us. Another reason is that if you say you like something and someone else says they like something, we can put, a, we can put you in a brain scanner now, and if there's a similar reaction and you, we, we, we trust that you're saying that you like something, we can agree that you, like, you just enjoyed that thing. We don't do that with animals. We, we, we haven't the capability of assessing pleasure in animals, really. But, and so there's been a great reluctance in animal behavior over the last, well, forever, of actually saying, maybe they do this because they like it. We don't don't know. Uh, if any of you have got dogs or cats, it's pretty uncontroversial to suggest that they are enjoying themselves if a cat's purring or a dog's wagging its tail. But it's, it's something which is quite hard to scientifically assess. But the point is in this case is that, well, we don't know why they're doing this. Maybe they like it. Maybe it's for a reason that we have no idea about. For, uh, for 500 years, the Christian church has decreed that homosexuality in nature, uh, homosexuality is contra naturum, so it's against nature. And, and that is still believed as, uh, all, all over the world in many places, and homosexuality is, is still um, criminal in many places, and gay men and women are, are uh, uh, prosecuted and persecuted. Uh, it's clearly not contra naturum. Wherever we look in sexual behaviours in animals, we see homosexual behaviours. And, and again, sometimes we understand why, and in the case of the giraffes, we have no idea, and that's fine. Right, now... That's, that's enough about sex. There's tons more in the book. Um, but let me, let me just get back to the idea of cultural transmission because one of the, the, the key idea, the thing that I think is um, really the, the, the central thesis in the book, which is a relatively new idea, which hasn't been talked enough about. And, and it's, it's back to the idea of cultural transmission. So 
that there's a particular, very few people have studied this, and they've studied it using archaeological remains and uh, statistical techniques where you plug into large computers now, but also um, mathematical modeling. Um, and the idea is that cultural transmission, the effectiveness of cultural transmission, is dependent on population size. And this is an idea known as demographic transition. So it's primarily led by some of my colleagues at, in the genetics department at UCL, but also some researchers based in, in Harvard. And it's the, it's the I idea that populations above a certain size maximize, optimize the the um, efficiency of transferring ideas from one individual to another. Now, that sounds very highfalutin, but the, a simpler way of explaining it is that we are a species of experts. There is no other species where our talents are so unevenly distributed amongst the populace. And so what do you do if you want to learn how to do something? You ask someone who knows how to do it. Now, it, it appears that we've been doing this for you know, a long time, tens of thousands of years, 50,000 years, maybe. And from these new mathematical models, the implication seems to be that when a population is below a certain size, the efficiency or the optimization of that of that transfer of information is, is low, but above a certain size, and it's not really a number so much as a sort of concept of population growth, um, the, the transfer of that information is optimized and populations can subsequently grow and sort of bud off. Now we see this in the archeological remains. What, what we see is that spontaneously, apparently spontaneously, it's a, a sort of temporarily associated with climate changes which allow populations to grow in size. We see it in, Aus we see it in Europe, we see it in Africa, we see it in Australia at, at different times between 40 and 20,000 years ago. But at each of those times we see a population expansion and then we see all of those sophisticated tools that I, saw, that I showed you at the beginning. And that's the first time we see them, and we see them continuously from that point on. And so that's, that's the central idea, that it is population size, this idea of demographic transition, which is crucial in the emergence of behavioral modernity. So it's, again, that idea, we teach, right? We are, we are a species that teaches, and it's, it's not just unique to us, it's absolutely essential to our development in terms of modern human behavior. There's a, there's a flip side argument to this which supports the same idea, and it concerns fishing because, well, you can spear fish, but a hook is much better, as any fisherman will tell you. Right? A hook is much better for catching fish because it won't, it won't wriggle off. This is the earliest example of a uh, fishing hook. It's, it's from Java about 24,000 years ago. It's actually the bottom of a shell. It's simply been cut off, and it's still sharp enough to cut meat to this day. So 24,000 years ago, we have the beginning of shell a hook technology like this. By 10,000 years ago, and this is now in Europe, we have incredibly sophisticated, fine bone um, carved harpoons, which are much better at, um, uh, at uh, ca capturing larger fish and going out further out into the ocean and enriching our diet. Now, there's the counterexample that I want to talk about is very briefly, because it's now the end, is Tasmania. So this is a slightly culturally sensitive idea to talk about, and I'll just talk about the facts. So Tasmania was m attached to mainland Australia until the end of the last ice age. So when the last glacial maximum um, ended, the waters of the sea, the, the ice melted and the seas rose and Tasmania becomes an island for the next 11,000 years. There are, people on, there, there are people distributed across that land until it's separated and you have then Tasmanians and Australians, um, mainland Australians, who are separated for the next 10,000 years. And there's not really any evidence that, that they ever... Um, they, they ever met again until European colonialised uh, uh, colonists arrived in the 17th, 18th century. Now, during that time, so what we know from the archaeological remains is that um, Australians, when, they were, when Tasmania was joined to Australia, uh, they, they had a few dozen tools in their tool set, including things like this. By the time that Europeans arrive in, in Tasmania in the 17th century, on mainland Australia, their tool set has gone up to something like 120 and Tasmania has gone down to around about 12, right? Now, what we think is that the population size was inherently restricted, and therefore the flow of information and expertise was simply lost over time. So good examples of this are that they stopped fishing beyond the shore and returned to foraging at the shore looking for um, sessile, non-moving non animals like crustaceans and uh, probably the pom-pom crabs again. Um, but at the same time, the, 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 the ability to share information uh, widely across a much larger population in Australia, their technological development 
continued. Now, maybe the Tasmanians were particularly happy with, with, with that as a development, but their population doesn't grow, which in general is a good measure of evolutionary success. So that's the idea, right? So you've got these examples of how suddenly the emergence of behavioral modernity occurs in Africa, in um, in southern Europe, but also in Indonesia and in Australia, and all these things happen at roughly the same time through this process where we are teaching and sharing ideas in an optimized way due to, um, due to the size of our populations. That is the new idea, which is not really talked about much in the scientific literature, although it is the theory that I am most happy with about the emergence of behavioral modernity. Now, I'll just end with one last quote, because I say this is new, this first paper was published in this field in 2010, and there's been a handful of papers. I'm, like I said, it, it's the idea that I'm most wedded to. Who first suggested it? Well, it was Charles Darwin, who came up with exactly the same idea, albeit in a short paragraph in 1871, where he alludes to exactly the same idea with this quote, which I'll read out. As humans advance in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he or she ought to extend their social instincts and sympathies to all members of the same nation, though personally unknown to them. And that's all. We are a species that is social. We are a species of experts and we are a species of teachers. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Take a seat. Thank you, Adam, for this very elaborate and insightful lecture. My pleasure. Um, I told you already it's a bit of a deformation for a philosopher, but the first question I'm going to ask is why? Um, why did you feel it was so important to address this specific question, what it is that makes us human and what it is that makes us unique? Well, I think it's the most fundamental question that humans have always been asking. Um, and, you know, I've given the scientific perspective on this, but of course, philosophers and artists and writers and poets have been attempting this question. I think with much more insight than scientists until the relatively recent past, and then we've been asking that question for, you know, thousands of years. Um, I think that it is part of my mission that I mentioned at the beginning to steer us away from very simple, straightforward, linear narratives about how, you know, why we are the way we are, because it's a, it's, I, I, I've given you a solution, which I think is the correct, I think is the most accurate description of what we know mm -hmm. based on the evidence, but it's not definitive. So, and, well, because about this mission, you, you talk about these singular explanations, which are uh, always insufficient um, and proven wrong as well. Um, and just to be clear, how is this idea of cultural trans transmission not one thing? Because it's, it yeah, one so it, it's a very fair point, because it it underwrites everything else that we do that is either unique to humans or um, it, we do better or differently from other animals. So things like, so the, the idea of cultural transmission via this specific model, what emerges from that are all sorts of things that we are, we, we legitimately say are unique to us or sort of unique to us or kind, you know, all the things I talked about. Um, and, and many, many more. But I think that, that what, what the cultural transmission by demographic transition idea does is it puts down a framework, a sort of base layer, which says this is a behavior which appears to be something that no other creature has done. And as a result of that, this is, this is the place from which all of the stuff that we do happens. So, and let me ask you, do you attach any value to this? Because the, the background of my question as to why you're asking this question is because it always makes me quite uncomfortable. <laughs> um, because in philosophy, for example, a lot of... Uh, um, the biggest reason on asking why are we human and what makes us human is to prove that we are not a mere ape or that we are uh, God's creatures or that... So there's always a special value attached to this uniqueness. Uh, so we're a higher evolved species versus lower evolved species. I'm quite sure you're not <laughs> <laughs> thinking along those lines. Well, that's, but that's do you attach any value to... No, because that's why you're a philosopher and I'm a scientist. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, because cause it's quite clear that I don't think that as well. And also, you know, we, we don't... We don't I, I, I think what's most interesting about this question is that we are a, a paradox, because we now accept that we are animals. We don't talk about higher and lower species anymore. Well, we try not to. Um, all species are as evolved as all other species. 
we do have a set of behaviors which, which are very unusual. We've managed to spread ourselves around the world in a way that is very unusual. We talk about us being the dominant species. Well, you know, that really depends on how you measure it because there are bacteria that have been around for four billion years mm -hmm. and will be around for another four billion years after we're gone, and they are by far the greatest um, uh, type of organisms by mass and by cell count, by, by biomass. So, you know, it, it kind of depends on, on how you measure these things. We're not meant to be into sort of hierarchies in, in, in science. And I, I note that this slide has, I don't know whether this was deliberate or not, but this is one of my least favorite images <laughs> in the history of science. Well, this is a version of it. And thank you for putting it up because it gives us an opportunity to talk about what's please wrong do. with this picture. Yeah, please do. Right? Um, and I've got a, at college, I've got a lecture which is entirely based around this image. So this is, this, is, this will be very familiar to you, to most people. It's, it's, it was originally appeared in a textbook, in a French textbook in the 1960s, and it's called The March of Progress. And this is a modified version of it, of course. Um, but it, it, it's meant to be describing the evolution of humankind, but it actually rep misrepresents evolution in two very specific ways, which are really, really counterproductive in terms of understanding how we think mm -hmm. about evolution in general. The first is it implies direction to our evolution. It's, it's got a, a monkey-like creature on the far left, and then there's, it goes more upright, and then you've got some sort of cave creature, and, and the traditional version is it ends up with a, a white Anglo-Saxon man with a beard and a spear, and he's always got his, left le <laughs> his right leg in front of his left leg. So you can't see the way that all of this happened, <laughs> right? So that's the first thing. It implies direction. There is no direction to evolution. There is no inevitability about our sophisticated tool use or cognitive capabilities. Uh, I, I think consciousness and our intellectual abilities are an emergent property from our evolution. Um, so th it, implies, it implies direction, and there is no direction to evolution. The second thing is it implies that we know that route, and we do not. I think, you know, 20 years ago in the textbooks, when I was growing up, we, we, knew every single, we, we, we knew every single step between, you know, the last common ancestor of us and gorillas and chimpanzees and us today. And now we know none of them. <laughs> and that's really cool. That's how science should work. You know, to, when, 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 when you're confident about stuff in science, then that's the point when you should be thinking, have I got this right? And the more you look, the more, the more we've studied human evolution, and the more bones we found, the less sure we are about the picture. And that's great, because it means like people like me and Simon and genetics departments all around the world have got an infinite amount of work to do. <laughs> and you, you're not worried that your book will be inter interpreted in terms of these, like um, as a proof that we are unique and uh, that we are better maybe than... I, well, I hope not. Um, I, I mean, I'm quite, I try to be quite clear that the conundrum is that we are special and, and we're not at the same time. And I'm sort of happy with that as, a, as, as an idea, that it's, we can celebrate how awesome humans are mm -hmm. without, being, without putting us at the top of any sort of chain. You know, we can do tons of stuff that loads of animals can't do. But, you know, a mantis shrimp can see in 17 different... Um, wavelengths of light, including polarized light. <laughs> and a mantis shrimp, an octopus, doesn't give a monkey's... Uh, no, wait a minute, that's a weird phrase. Uh, an octopus doesn't care at all <laughs> yeah, okay. about, you know, um, this. And they, they seem quite happy. You know... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the fact is we care. That's one of the things that makes us well, right. unique. Well, that, 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 yeah. is, that is the thing that is worth celebrating in us, is that we are the only species that has actually asked the question, we think. Maybe they just don't care. Yeah. Maybe they know the answers. And, and Maybe we don't like, understand. <laughs> it's just not that interesting. You know, rotifers <laughs> abandoned males. Deloid rotifers abandoned males about five million years ago, I think. They seem to be doing fine. <laughs> okay. Um, just one more question about your book. The title is The Book of Humans, The Story of How We Became Us. Yeah. And you haven't really addressed the how no. in this uh, No, <laughs> in this and in lecture. fact, in fact, in the paperback version, we've changed the subtitle. Oh, really? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, publishers write subtitles. Because the editor asked this question as yeah. well. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. It's a, it's a good question, but it's all part of the le learning process of writing because, you, you know, you, it's, this is a crowded market for writing about humans um, 
and there are some good books and some bad books out, out there. Um, uh, so how do you distinguish yourself in that field? Um, is a tricky question, and one of the ways you do that is by talking about weird animal sex. Um, but, but, you know, the, the other thing, and I think this is, the, like I said a couple of times, the thing that I try to do more than anything is embrace the complexity and revel in the beauty of unending stories and non-linear narratives. I, I know that humans need and love stories, and our stories... Are, have beginnings, middles, and ends, and they tell us trajectories, and, and uh, they tell us about how, how we change. Um, and that's good, and I love stories. Um, but that's not, that's not how evolution works, and it's not how life and time works. And we should be able to do both things. We should be able to talk, about, talk accurately about the science and the evolutionary trajectory of life on Earth without needing to rely on linear narratives that result in the hero's journey going from place A via place B and getting to place C. Because mm -hmm. that's just not how this stuff works. Um, so I'd rather be honest about that and, and sort of celebrate that, 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 that complexity. Yeah, but still then, is, is there no room there for um, answering the question how we became us? So, because I'm not asking why we became us, or why, I'm not asking for a direction. Yeah. But do you have any, any ideas as to how we developed this skill and this... Well, yeah, I mean, so, so it, it is through social interaction. So it is through, it, it's through the random chance of, of um, in our environment changing, which means that for but, you know, whatever reasons, we reproduce more successfully, we have more access to food, and so we have reproductive success, and our communities got bigger, and at the same time, see, you know, there, there isn't a linear version of this, of, this, of this story in itself. Lots of different things contribute to being the development of behavioral modernity, many of which are just random, you know, some of which will have a genetic basis, others won't, they will have social bases. One of the things I think is interesting about why we don't talk about this idea more, I think is because it is... In a, there is one interpretation of it which is anti-Darwinian. And there's a sort of specific technical reason for that. It's not anti-Darwinian, but it looks like it could be. Uh, and, and that's to do with the gene-centric view of evolution, which is the, which, which is the correct one, which is the, you know, the idea of the selfish gene, which is that the unit of selection that, that, that nature operates in is the gene. And we are merely husks. Our animals, all organisms, are merely husks for the most effective way of transmitting one gene to the next generation in concert with a bunch of other genes, right? Now, that, that model is correct. For a long time, whilst um, this was an idea being developed, there were arguments within the scientific community about whether what was the unit of selection. Was it the gene? Was it the individual? Was it the family? Was it the group or was it the species? Now, the, the evidence suggests that it's the gene and none of the rest of those things. The idea of demographic transition by cultural transmission, sorry, demographic, what was it? What's the, what's the main idea of my book again? <laughs> um, de Demographic transgression. Demi transition, I think, uh, yeah. transition, sorry. Cultural <laughs> yeah. transmission, yeah. yeah. Um, is it looks like it's group selection. So it looks like it's, it's a cultural selection rather than individual mm -hmm. genes. There isn't a significant genetic change that results us in being able to make statues or do, do art. I, we haven't even talked about communication and speech, which is absolutely central to this, and there's, a, there's, a, there's plenty of it in, in the book. But again, that's, a, that's another extraordinarily complex trajectory of multiple lines of very complex aspects of, of biology, which include neuroscience, motor skills, just physical anatomy of our tongues and jaws and lips and bones in our, in our larynx and pharynx. Um, and so over the years, people have suggested that it was a single trigger which has taken us from being apes that don't speak into apes that can do this. Um, and again, I reject that. Chomsky thinks that. Chomsky thinks that mm -hmm. there is, a, there is a, a trick. I don't know why I'm saying this, because the man who knows most about this on Earth is, is sitting right there. Um, <laughs> so so this, this is uh, <laughs> it's slightly ridiculous that I'm saying this in front of... In front of how am I doing? Not bad, OK? Not bad. <laughs> right. He'll send me an email later. <laughs> With 19 points. <laughs> um, so I haven't even mentioned, mentioned that. But, but again, you know, all of these things are essential. So, you know... The ways our brains develop to recognize other minds. So that's a sort of loose 
way of thinking about consciousness, the, the evolutionary advantage of being able to try and work out what you're thinking, which I'm thinking is <laughs> yeah, okay. desperate for a drink now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Make this stop. <laughs> Why is he still talking? You know, <laughs> things like that. Um, but, but also, you know, th things that you might say are not obvious uh, things to, to enhance reproductive success, like, you know, we started doing music or doing art, th things that don't have an immediate benefit. Or may maybe it is, maybe the ability to carve a flute and play the flute in a, in, a, um, in a group of people does make you sexually more attractive. Well, I mean, it works for guitarists in bands <laughs> and bands and not for drummers. So, you know, there's certainly something... In, in that, but you know, the idea that we sort of loosened the shackles of natural selection by all the cultural stuff that we do, that we that we began um, doing fifty to hundred thousand years ago, you know, the, these are all aspects of evolution which are underwritten by biology, by genetics, um, but not entirely dependent on them. Then much more. Um, so here, here's an analogy which I haven't used in the book, but I've, I use elsewhere. I mean, actually, including this in the new book. If you think about us as a sort of um, in, in sort of computer terms, right? Um, you've got the hardware, which is um, our biology, our genetics, and, and you've got the software, which is our culture. Now, more than any other organism, I think I think this is right, fair to say, more than any other creature, we have shifted the significance of the software, which is our culture, away from the hardware, which is our genetics. Both are still massively important, but we are we are so dependent on our non-genetic um, um, facets or evolution more than, more than any other creature. I'm now looking to you for, for acknowledgement for that. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 not a, it's not a perfect analogy, but I think, I think the idea that we've, sh we, we, we've, transferred to, we've transferred the importance of the, away from the hardware into the software is... is okay. Did you like that? Is it, can I no, ask you? No, someone <laughs> actually shook their head then. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. It's probably a computer scientist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but could I then say that your mission maybe is to move away, as a, as a geneticist, that your mission might be to move away from this gene-centric view and um, have a look at humans in a more cultural um, way? Um, so in an no, uh, well, yes and no. The gene-centric view of evolution is correct. I, I, there's, it will be a, a famous scientist who who get who demonstrates that that is not the main mode mm -hmm. of evolutionary change. Um, he, he just that guy just disagrees so much he's just walked out. <laughs> <laughs> that was E.O. Wilson. <laughs> um, um, but, uh, well, we can be both, right? I mean, with, with, with that, that, that is, that is all, all, all creatures are, so we, don't, we tend not to use the word cultural, but, uh, you know, influenced by environment and their own behavior, how it interacts with the environment, some of which has a genetic basis and some of which doesn't. Um, so it is both of those things. But again, you know, it's the same idea. It's combining these things to, to try and understand the complexity. of The thing that we, do, that we fail to appreciate, the reason we get evolution wrong so often is just the staggering amount of time that it, it has had, that life on Earth has had to get to this point in us or cuttlefish or octopus or bonobos or whatever. Um, the, the, it's unimaginable time that has allowed this process to be enacted in so fundamentally the same way, but in so many different varieties. Evolution is the most creative force that has ever existed. Um, and and it, it is a combination of a gene-centric view of evolution and everything else that isn't genes. So that's the, you know, nature and nurture. We used to say nature versus mm -hmm. nurture, um, that, which is not a useful way of thinking about biology. Nature via nurture is a, is an, is a phrase that um, the writer Matt Ridley came up with, which is better. Nature is genes. Nurture is everything that isn't genes. And it's not just whether your parents cuddled you when you were a kid or read your books, although that is part of it. It's random stuff, like the orientation of the embryo in the womb. Or um, uh, you know the the, the cellular activity uh, around the embryo. The, all things which aren't primarily genetically um, moderated counters the environment, and the complex interaction between the environment, the nurture bit, 
and nature. Well, that's, 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 that's what makes a life as an individual, but that is also the trajectory that, that, is, uh, that is fundamental to evolution.